make disciples. And so I was just thinking about those who were just recently baptized, and actually all of us who have been baptized can benefit, and even those who haven't been baptized, obviously the word of Yahweh we can benefit from. But Yeshua gave us five marks, hallelujah, in, in, in Luke chapter 14. He gave us five marks of, of what it, it takes to make a disciple. And so I was thinking about Yaakov Smirnov. I don't, you guys may not know him. He was a, com, a Russian comedian. And he, he used to always tell jokes about how when he first came from Russia, uh, all the things that, you know, he, the freedoms and the things that he saw in America, and especially in the supermarket, like things we had available. You know, he's like powdered milk. Wow, you know, all you have to do is add water and you have milk. You know, he's powdered orange juice. All you have to do is, you know, add water and, 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 and you have uh, uh, orange juice. So then he, he was thinking about, uh, he saw pow powdered, uh, what, is it, what is it, a powdered baby formula. And so he was like, what? Well, it's an amazing country. All you have to do is water, and there you have is, is the babies. And he was just going crazy, you know. I guess you had to beat her. But anyway, his accent and everything. But Yaakov Smirnov, he, he, you know, he, he was confused. But so were a lot of um, believers, you know, as far as what it takes to make a disciple. Some people believe that all you do, and it, and it should be this way, but is, is add a sinner, um, you know, and uh, someone who believes, add, add some baptismal water, and poof, what do you have? Automatic disciple, right? But no, it, it, it takes a little more than a little, so a little dip in some water to make a disciple. And there's many people who have been baptized, but that's where they, start, they stop. They don't go further into discipleship. Amen? And so, we, you know, a disciple is, is, is made, you know, it's, it's, a disciple is not just born, but it's, all, it's made. And a disciple, just like a baby, you know, is, is born, a baby born, as it grows up, it needs dis love, and part of that love is discipline. And just like the word disciple, it has discipline in it. You know, you need discipline because the parent disciplines the, the child that he loves. Am I correct? Amen? So... In Luke chapter 14, I want you to turn there with me if you haven't already. Yeshua is getting closer and closer to Calvary. People uh, wanted to see miracles, and they wanted free meals too, you know, from him. And they were mobbing him. And the crowd is about to become extremely less. You know why? Because Yeshua is, is going to start bringing forth the cost of discipleship. And so, it's not a popular message. It requires a total commitment. Now, let me tell you a story. There was a cow and there was a hen. And they both shared the same barnyard. And there's a church, you know, nearby that they started attending. And, they, and, it, and this church is starting to give food to the poor. And so they wanted to know, what must we do to help provide meals, you know, to, you know for the poor, you know, to, to contribute? And the hen comes up with an idea. I got a great idea. Let us both, let's, let's supply the church with uh, steak and eggs, you know? And the cow thinks about the hen's uh, um, proposal, and he says, there's one thing wrong with your, your proposal, you, you just have to make a contribution. Me, I have to be totally dedicated. Now, that's the, that is the cost of discipleship. Right there. Yeshua, he don't just want it. He don't want much. He just wants everything, right? Correct? The Yeshua wants everything because did he not give everything himself? Amen? For us on Calvary? He wants everything. So in this passage of scripture, Yeshua provided five vivid images and used each one to teach a lesson about discipleship. So let's number them as we read the text. You look at, at, at Luke 14, verse 26. Large crowds were traveling with Yeshua and turning to them, he said, 
If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brother and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Right? That's, we, we want to mark that. That's, that's number one mark that we have for Yeshua. And it, it, he has. And in verse 27, he says, And anyone who does not carry his cross, some prefer torture, torture stake, and follow me cannot be my disciple. That's mark number two. In verse 28, Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it. For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. That's Mark number 3. Verse 31. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with then to, with the 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000. If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything, he has cannot be my disciple. That's Mark number four. Verse 34. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. That's Mark number five. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says, all right? Hallelujah. People choose to follow Yeshua on different levels of commitment, different levels of intimacy. It's, it's, a, it's a, like a set of, of uh, concentric circles. In fact, I, sh I, should have, I meant to have a little board up here and with, with circles, you know, a bunch of circles, an outward circle, inward circle. Well, if you can picture in your imagination an outward circle, doo -doo 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 -doo, all right? And in the middle is, is the cross, Calvary, all right? Now, you have people on the outward circle um, they, they attend church on a fairly um, regular basis. Wait, hold oh, no, on. No, that's the, excuse me. You have people on the outward circle, but they seldom ever worship with, pe with others. You know, they, they say they, they're, they believe in Yeshua, you know, but they're like, they're like a crowd in, in mainstream Christians, Christianity that, that, you know, they just show up on Christmas or Easter. Or as far as our church, they might show up maybe every now and then on Passover or the Feast of Tabernacles. But other than that, where do, you, you don't, where do you see them today? They're not here, right? All right? These people are on the outside. For, for them to do more would take too much commitment. Then, then on, out, inside that is another circle. Now, these people have a slightly deeper uh, level of commitment. They do go to church regularly, and they attend regularly. In, in, you know, in other words, they like to congregate with other people who worship, right? But they're not active members of any local church. You know, they may call themselves church shoppers, but you, you might as well call them church hoppers. You know, they're not really dedicated to any one local church. They just, you know, like go over here, sample. I'll go over here, sample. And just get with different people, you know what I'm saying? They're not really invested, you know, you know, seriously in a church, any one church or anything like that. They just, you know, do their thing. But then there's even, you know, a deeper level. And those are people that actually come to church. Okay, these people come to church and they and they're and they sit there and they, they warm the pews and they, they, they say hallelujah and they maybe even give tithes here and there. But you know they're not really into uh, you know they're like hypocritical. They're not, they're not applying the word. They, you know, they just sit there and stuff like that. And, 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 and actually, they're not, they're not really benefiting from, to, from the word too much. They let, when they leave the door of the church, they go back to the, to the same way they were. But then there's the core members of the church, true disciples. And you know where the, where the, the cross was in the middle? 
of the circle. We got one, two. You get it's getting closer and closer to the to the cross. This this circle goes right into the midst of the of the cross. The, these people truly identify with what Yeshua's work and how he gave everything on Calvary. These people are sold out. These are the people. Um, how you say in a church? Out of uh, it's usually twenty percent of the people in the church that do mo eighty percent of the work. It's usually twenty percent of the people in the church that that are that are busy like in, in the ministries and and, and committed and, and serving Yeshua like they should be. These people are sold out. They give everything. This is the core of the church. This is where we should all be striving to get. This is where we sh we should be. As disciples, we should become, we should be wanting to be a, a core. We should want to go from, from the outside circle of every now and then we, we have some association with Yeshua to, to you know, we're, we're just in a church congregating in, di in different churches. We should want to get to the place where we are actually hardcore invested in the service of Yeshua the Messiah, dedicated to, the, to his church family that was brought up today, and then, and then what we do from there is we, we, we start to go back out and, and, and reach out to those who aren't and try, try to bring them in. Amen? This is what we should be doing, the committed core. And so ask yourself, which circle represents you? Where would you like to be in that circle? Amen? So let, as we look at these five marks in Luke 25, through 35, let's, let's look at these vivid images that Yeshua uses and dig into the meat now of what he's saying. Number one, he brings up a family. And what he's trying to say to us as disciples is a disciple loves Yeshua supremely. The first image Yeshua like, uses is a family. Now, are you surprised that Yeshua says that to be a disciple you must hate your family? I read about one pastor that, that preached a sermon on how do you hate your wife, you know? <laughs> but uh, you may be asking, well, doesn't Yeshua talk about loving everybody, even loving your enemy at one point? What's he mean, hate your family, you know? But see, we got to remember that Yeshua often used figures of speech, you know? Um, and he used, he used these figures of speech to give his words greater impact, okay? He used metaphors, similes parables, and here he simply employs what we call a hyperbole, okay? All right, hyperbole is an intentional exaggeration to emphasize a point. Okay, my wife uses hyperboles with me all the time. She says, didn't I tell you a million times to charge your phone battery? I mean, why is it you have a cell phone? And, you know, I know it's not, she doesn't actually tell me a million times. It's actually about a half a million, you know? But, you know, so, but... But that's the point, you know. It's 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 Yeshua is 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 using, you know, hyperbole. So don't get ex don't get upset when he uses hyperbole. But also, if you look at the Greek word here, in the verse, it it means something totally different than our English word for hate. The word here is sane or sunny, which means to prefer above. So to be a disciple. You must love Yeshua more or above the love of everyone else, even family members. You love Yeshua, your love for Yeshua should be more powerful than in comparison to any relationship you have, whether your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your wife, your husband, you know, anything. You know, it must be so powerful that it seems as if you hate everyone else, you know? And it's also true that sometimes your love for Yeshua will alienate you from others, even your family. All right? There was a former Muslim that came to know Yeshua and was baptized. And it was a tough decision for him because he knew that the moment his family learned that he'd become a Christian, that they would basically disown him. Matter of fact, more than that, they would hold a funeral for him and declare him dead to them. But he had to choose Yahshua anyway over his family. You know, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deep, deep commitment to, to, to follow after Yeshua, to follow after the master. You can look for people to ridicule you. 
and oppose you in, on all levels when you try to follow sincerely the path that Yeshua has for you. But you don't actually have to look for them because they'll find you. And sometimes it'll be your family. Your own family. Who's, you know, Yeshua said, you know, in Matthew 10, 22, you don't have to turn there. He said, all men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And, and in verse 37, he says, anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Yeshua said this. If you don't love Yeshua more than your own kids, you're not worthy of him. If you love your mother and father, your husband and wife, more than Yeshua, you're not worthy of him. Yeshua said it, not me. So, that, so getting back to, to um, Luke chapter 14, this is what Yeshua is saying. I mean, before we get back, into, I want to talk about Heather Mercer and Dana Curry. You may have heard of them. They were arrested by the Taliban and held prisoner for 128 days in Afghanistan. They both attended Baylor University and surrendered their lives to, to be fully devoted to Yeshua. Okay? And so Dateline interviewed um, Heather's, uh, Mercer's mother, and it was kind of a story the media likes because, you know, they, they start playing the family against each other and dividing the family against each other. And, and they, they, want, they kept bringing out to, to Heather, how is it that you went against the advice of your own family, your own mother? She told you not to do it because she was totally opposed to Heather and you know, going to Afghanistan. You know, and they kept emphasizing, you just went against the, 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 you know, your own mother and your own family as a vice, you know? And, you know, and, and it, the media really just played upon Heather's commitment to Yeshua. And so... But Heather displayed exactly what Yeshua meant in verse 26. In her book, Prisoners of Hope, Heather wrote, We answered hard questions posed by our families or friends. Extraordinary are the parents who don't balk at the idea of their child moving to a third world war-ravaged, drought-stricken country, and in this case, a country serving as a hub for international terrorist activity. That, that we had decided to go as Christian aid workers to a country where a harsh, unpredictable regime severely curtailed religious freedom gave most of our loved ones pause at best and otherwise prompted serious alarm. We were asked, aren't you being foolish? Why would you jeopardize your own safety? My friends, I want you to know that when Yahweh calls you to do something, you may have to make some, some difficult decisions. And sometimes your family will not jump for joy up and down, you know, over your choices. That's the first mark of a true disciple. My brother Leo here, his family did not jump up and down, and they will not jump up and down when he, when he tells them that he doesn't celebrate Christmas anymore. His friends did not jump up and down when he told them this summer, when they asked him, why don't you participate in the usual summer basketball program? They didn't jump up down when he told him he couldn't play because why? He would be required to practice and play on the Sabbath. You know? He, let's give Leo a clap as a matter of fact. You know? Encourage him. Amen? So, next, Mark number two. Yeshua talks about the cross. And he wants us to know that disciples live like dead people. Okay? So the image of the cross or the torture stake. A real disciple is someone who carries his cross. Many Christians today are confused about what that means. You know, I heard one Christian tell me, you know what? Uh, I got this, this nasty ingrown toenail, and, and, and it just pains me and, and stuff like that. And, and I'm like, and I'm like what? And they're like, they're like well, I guess that's just a cross I have to carry, you know. I'm like, you need to get that thing worked on. Why don't you get a doctor or someone to work on that? You know what I mean? Another guy's like, I get my terrible migraine headaches. Oh, I got this is a cross I have to bear, you know, carry. And I'm like, come on now. The, the cross of Yahweh, the, 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 the torture stake that Yeshua is not a migraine headache. It is not an ingrown toenail. 
Okay? The cross of Yeshua is, let me, let me explain this to you. In Yeshua's time, it was the death penalty. It was, in other words, what if, so, you know, how, raise your hand, how many of you wear crosses on, you know, on, on your person or have them on your Bible somewhere? Raise your hand. Okay. What would you do if people started selling electric chairs? You know, or poisonous sy syringes full of poison. What would you do? What if, what if you go down to your favorite store and someone says, oh, well, I like your electric chair you're wearing. Where did you get it? Huh? You know? Huh? You know? I mean, you know, uh, what, what's the name of some of these jewelry places? Give me a, a, pro a, a proper jewelry name. Okay. Kings. Okay. Hey, what did you say? Jared. Jared. <laughs> All right. But, you know, what, what, I mean, what if someone says, oh, I, I like that, uh, that King's, uh, you know, poisonous syringe you have. I want to get one, too. I mean, I mean, would you rush out and buy one? In Yeshua's day, that's what this was. This was the death penalty. This was the electric chair. This was, this was the, 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 the gas chamber. This is what Calvary meant. This is what the cross meant. People water it down nowadays. It's just some little uh, ornament to be worn you know, as a decorative piece to people anymore. And that's why I like the movie The Passion so much, because, it, because the seriousness of Calvary has been lost in the days. You know? Hallelujah. Basically, you know, what we need to, people need to know is that, that the, the cross is not some benign piece of harmless jewelry. It, it, like I said, it was the noose. It was the, it was, it was, it meant that you were going to die. As a matter of fact, you know how a, a death row, a prisoner, he, he, he's, he's walking down towards the place of execution? What did the prisoner say? Dead man walking. That means he, he's, he, now he's alive, he's breathing, he's walking, but he's, he's, just, he's already dead. He's, just, he's, a, he's a dead man walking. That's the same thing Yeshua meant when he said you must carry your cross. You're just like a dead man. Amen? And so therefore, we are dead people. The disciple is supposed, to, is supposed to be start being as a dead man. We should just start acting like dead people, right? Paul understood. Well, that's right. Paul understood what it meant. Matter of fact, hold your place there and, and turn with me to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. There's three places in Galatians that perfectly illustrate what it means to be a dead man. Okay. It says here, I have been crucified with Messiah, and I no longer live, but Messiah lives in me. Go up to, to chapter 5, verse 24. It says in chapter 5, verse 24, those who belong to Messiah Yeshua have crucified the sinful nature with his passions and desires. Go up to, to chapter 6, verse 14. Chapter 6, verse 14 says, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Yeshua Messiah, through which the world may has been, the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Let me hear you say, There is nothing in this world that interests me. <laughs> Hallelujah. If that's true, if that statement is true, then you are dead to the world and the world is dead to you. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise Yahweh. The cross is laid on every Christian. Those that have been baptized should know that we embark upon discipleship. When we embark upon discipleship, we surrender control of our lives to the Messiah. We are in, in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. Now, the cross is not a terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life. It's how we begin, you know? We, we, we meet at the beginning of our communion with Yeshua. You know, Yeshua calls a man and bids him to come and die. The, in other words, the way to new life is death. Amen? Amen? It begins with death. And, and in many ways, a dead man is set free. You won't be truly liberated until you understand what 
it is to be crucified with Messiah. Now the next image Yeshua brings is that's Mark number three, is a tower, right? And he wants the disciple to know that a, a good finish is valuable. There's a value in, in, in finishing good or finishing well. Yeshua presents the image of a man who plans to build a tower. Before he begins the construction, he must count the cost to see if he has enough resources to finish the job. Now, faith, everyone knows my favorite acronym for faith. Faith, F is forsaking, A is all, I is I, T is trust him. Forsaking all, I trust him. Faith is the cost of discipleship. Without it, it is impossible, the Bible says, to please Elohim. You can't be a pleasing disciple to Elohim without faith, okay? So that's what we need because without faith, guess what? Before you embark in a Christian life, if you stop and ask without faith, do I have the resources I need to finish this salvation job? Your answer will always be no. But thank goodness we do not walk by what we have, by our own resources. Thank goodness we have Yeshua the Messiah is his resources, amen? And faith in him, we have all that we need, amen, to overcome in, in, in this salvation journey. All that we need to complete the work that Yeshua starts in us. He is the author and the finisher of our faith, amen? Hallelujah. In Philippians 1, 6, you don't have to turn here, Paul said, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Yeshua is talking about the cost of total commitment. Total commitment. Actually, it's better to think in terms of value instead of cost. Okay? A good finish as a disciple is the key. See, there's a lot of backslidden Christians who will not make it into the kingdom of heaven because they're going to fail to finish well. Solomon is one example in the Bible of, of he was the wisest man in all history. Yahweh gave him the wisdom. Great man of Yahweh. But the Bible says he had many wives turn his heart from Yahweh. He didn't finish well. You know? I don't, I don't know about you, but it's a sad, sad thing, you know, to, 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 to not finish this race. And Yeshua, he's talking about, he's talking about, uh, like I said, a total commitment, a good finish. Yeshua spoke about a man in verse 29 who was not able to finish. Yeshua says everyone will look at this incompleted project and ridicule the one who didn't finish it. Now, I'm haunted by these words. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a spiritual dropout. You know, I'd rather drop out of high school than be a spiritual dropout. I'd rather drop out of college than be a spiritual dropout. Because there's worse things, there's nothing worse to drop out of than the kingdom of heaven. Is there? Let me hear you, let me know, let, let me see your hands of anyone here that wants to be a spiritual dropout. Raise your hand. Good, I don't see no one. Amen. You know, the older I get, the more I realize that there's, there's no cruise control in this Christian life. You know, there's no such thing as spiritual retirement. The, page, the pages of, of the Bible are littered with people who, who decide to take a break. I mean, I've been around long enough to see many people that were in the church, in the faith, true disciples. They've fallen away. I'm mean, sure they may still come to church every now and then, and there might be a chance they might get saved if they repent. But hey, if something doesn't change, they're not going to finish well. Hallelujah. Praise Yahweh. The second thing, let, let me hear you say this. Real disciples finish well. Disciples say it again. Real disciples finish well. Real finish well. Amen. I want you all to be a real dis disciple. Amen. Hallelujah. I mean, don't try your own strength. You know, some, some people are just sitting there on the track, you know, they've quit instead of finishing the race Yahweh has for us to run. 
Some of us are, are trying in our own strength to just barely drag ourselves across the finish line. But a real disciple depends on the strength of Yahweh so they can sprint across that, that finish line. Amen? And finish well. Amen? And that's what I hope you guys do. Now, the fourth mark Yeshua brings up is a war. He wants to let the disciple know that we must surrender to the stronger king. All right? So look at, look at, this, at, at the scripture here. Yeshua describes two kings. One is outnumbered, so he wisely approaches the stronger king and makes peace before the battle ever begins. Now you are and I are one of the kings, and Elohim is the other. Now guess which one we are? Anyone here know which one we are? Which king are we? That's right. That's right. Because we can never win against Yahweh, the king of kings, can we? We must surrender to him. And how do you, in Yeshua's time, a surrendering king could be, could be made into a slave of the opposing king. So it required great humility to bow down and ask for terms of peace. It, makes, it takes humility today to totally surrender to King Yeshua, doesn't it? It takes humility. Now, you and I cannot be a disciple unless we are willing to give up like I said, total control of our life to Yeshua. And for, for many, that's too hard a thing to do. No one wants to give up your life. I once read about a lifeguard on a beach who saw a drowning man. And he walked onto the surf but didn't go out to rescue him. The people gathered on the beach and yelled and screamed at the lifeguard, Go out and rescue the drowning man. The lifeguard waited a little deeper, you know. He waited a little deeper, but he just sat there and kept looking out there. And, and, and the people who looked at him said, what is wrong with you, man? Can't you see the guy's drowning? What is wrong with you? Can't you see the guy's drowning? Why are you just sitting there? And they kept trying to motivate him, but they didn't motivate him to swim out. He, would just, he just sat there. Just when it seemed the man was going down for the last time, the lifeguard swam out with strong strokes and grabbed the man and brought him back to shore. After some spitting and coughing, the man was conscious. But rather than hailing him as a hero, the onlookers were angry. And they, and they were like, what is your problem? And he said very patiently, you know, they, they, as they were calling him cowards and all kind of stuff, you saw he was drowning, they said. Why didn't you go out sooner? So he explained. You can see that he is much bigger and stronger than I am. If I had gone out sooner, he was thrashing and kicking so violently that he would have probably drowned both of us. You know? He says, what I did was by waiting until he had finally given up, then I was able to go out and save him. As long as he continued to try to save himself, I could not help him. So this is a powerful lesson for us when it comes to salvation. Amen? I think, it's, I think as long as you think as, that you're strong enough to save yourself, as long as you think that I can choose my own way and do my own thing and choose something else over Yahweh, you're not going to surrender to Yeshua. You know? It's only when you give up and realize you are hopelessly lost that Yeshua could come and rescue you. Have you ever come to a place in your life where you have surrendered everything you have and everything you are to Yeshua? I think real discipleship is coming to Yeshua and saying, Yeshua, I give up. I give control of my life to you. Matter of fact, let me hear you say, Yeshua, I give up. I give control of my life to you. Go ahead. Amen? Amen? That's what real discipleship is. I think one of the reasons the book of Psalms speaks of lifting up your hands, you know, in praise is because lifting up your hand has always been a gesture of surrender. Even today, I'm a police officer. If I point my gun at you and say, put your hands up, what are you doing? Huh? Right? You know? And so therefore, and I'm not even talking about people who are not Christians. I'm talking about Christians too. 
Christians should surrender too. I know I do. I'm a Christian and I surrender every day. I find myself having to surrender a lot of things on a daily basis to Yeshua. You know, I have to get on my knees and, you know, and I have to sit there and I have to lift my hands and I say, you know, I surrender all. I surrender all, all to thee, my precious Savior. I surrender all. You guys should do the same thing every day, right? Surrender. So finally, we, we go to mark number five. Salt. Yeshua uses the image of salt. And he wants the disciple to know that we must stay pure to, to preserve goodness. Salt was a very valuable thing during Yeshua's time. Roman soldiers were paid with salt rations. Matter of fact, the, the Latin phrase uh, solarium argentium is where we get the word salary. Even today, we speak of someone as not being worth the salt. Have you heard that before? You know? So, you know, they're not worth the salt. You know, you, sh- you, know, the, you know, so that, that's basically where that came from. I just learned that. That was amazing, you know. I thought, you know, if <laughs> in the time of Yeshua, the greatest value of salt was in its preservation property, you know, in a, as a preservative. Since they didn't have any way to refrigerate meat, salt would be applied to fresh meat to prevent meat from rotting. The salt created a chemical reaction that slowed down the process of decay. It retarded corruption. So as a consequence, it preserved the goodness of the meat. That's why Yeshua said in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? So we live in a nation suffering from moral decay, right? And it's it's decaying at an alarming rate. Our society is getting more rotten by day. Day by day, like salt, we must come into contact with our corrupting culture to slow down the process of decay, right? As salt, our job is to preserve the goodness that still exists in our culture. We must be the ones who speak up when sexually oriented businesses apply in our neighborhoods, you know, for a license. We must be ones who stand up and say, um, taking under... Yahweh are under God, you know, out of our Pledge of Allegiance, is not acceptable. We must be the ones who stand up and say in love that abortion is murder, right? And that homosexual behavior is perversion. If we don't speak out against moral evil, we've lost our saltiness. Now, that kind of activity is not going to make us popular in our culture, is it? No. As a matter of fact, people, they just passed a law just now that's saying that gay marriage, you know, that, that, that marriage is not just for, between a man and a woman. Now it's, you know, between a woman, woman, man and man. And so don't be surprised if you hear eventually some, some bunch of people protesting churches and, because they won't marry, um, you know, two men or two women, you know. But guess what? When, when you apply salt to a wound, what, what does it do? It stings. And so, when you're, so when you're standing as the soul of the world, I guess it's going to sting them. They ain't going to like it. And they're going you know, to come against you. And they're going to make outcry against you because they don't want salt being applied to their wounds, even though that same salt will kill the germs and, 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 and you know, disinfect that wound because they don't want to. It hurts. Amen? Praise Yahweh. So, in Yeshua's time, um, salt, matter of fact, let me, before I go back to that, the, pro, the problem with, with, um, with, with us is that Yeshua was dealing with people, he said, that, that had lost their saltiness. Amen? And so if we don't do these things, if we don't come up against the, 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 the evil and the corruption in our neighborhoods, we're going to lose our saltiness. So Yeshua, he, he, that's what he identifies with in Luke. He says, some people have lost their saltiness. And salt experts say that pure salt never loses its, its, its saltiness. Matter of fact, a crystal of salt 10,000 years ago 
10,000 years later will still be just as salty as it was 10,000 years ago. Pure salt never loses its saltiness. Now, Yeshua, did, in his day, they didn't mind salt. They, salt in his day came from the Dead Sea. So they, they, they gathered the water of the Dead Sea, and when the water evaporated, it left salt. The problem was that a lot of times there was mixed in all, so many different chemicals that it wasn't pure. And so the salt, though it looked like salt, though it poured like salt, when you put it on meat, it didn't taste like salt. It wasn't salty. And when you put it on meat, the meat rotted. It didn't, you know, preserve it, you know? So it was, it was, not, it was not good for anything, not, not good to be, you know, even a dung heap or nothing. Maybe you could throw it on the road and make gravel. That's about it, you know? But so, so what I'm saying is the salt, you know, in Yeshua's time, they didn't have any technology like we have today. Today, there's a simple chemical process we can do to change, make salt salty again. They didn't have that in Yeshua's time. But thank goodness we have today we, that what man couldn't do, Yeshua was always able to do by his blood. Amen? In other words, if we lose our saltiness today, can Yeshua restore us? Yes, by his blood he can wash away our sins. Amen? By his blood he can restore the saltiness in us. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We can be pure again. And guess what? The blood of Yeshua makes us pure but what keeps us pure? Huh? The word of Yahweh. His Bible, his word, living by his word is what keeps us pure. Amen? So, we, that's why we believers have to live pure lives. Hallelujah? We, you know, we have to, we have to keep ourselves pure by living by the word of Yahweh. And so, in conclusion, we want to be dangerous disciples, right? We're dis dangerous disciples in the world. You know, there's too many believers who aren't very harmful to the plan of Satan. You know, they're like, they're like a friend of mine who went into a store, and as he was going into the entrance of the store, there was a sign that said, danger, beware of dog. So he goes into the store, he's looking around, and he sees this old, decrepit dog laying there sleeping. And so then he goes up to the manager, and he's like, that dog doesn't look very dangerous to me. And the manager's like, I know. You know, I, but people kept tripping over them, so I thought it'd be nice to put the sign up. You know, but you know, but, but that's how some of us believers are, right? Right? We we have lost the danger. To, you know, as a real disciple, you want to be, you want to move from being on the outward circles of, you know, of being associate. You want to move deeper from being just a part of uh, the congregation. You want to become a part of the church. Those who are sold out for Yahweh. Amen? Hallelujah. You want to love Yeshua more than anyone else, more than your family, more than your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your wife, your husband. Hallelujah. You want to be a dead man walking, right? You want to carry your cross. You want to be committed to finishing well for Yeshua. Hallelujah. Are you constantly surrendering your all and everything you have to Yeshua? Are you willing to stay pure so that you can be salt in a rotting world? Yeshua is looking for a few good men and women. Amen? The humble, the pure, the dead, the committed. Will you decide today, hallelujah, to follow Yeshua and to move from being a mere believer to being a fully devoted disciple of Yeshua? Amen. And Yahweh bless you.